Let's get started. Uh, welcome. It's good to be back. Uh, for me, uh, Elixir Conf 2019 was my my first Elixir Conf, and so it's nice to be nice to be back here and back in in the world with all that's been all that's been going on for the past three years. So this is uh, Flame on profiling Elixir and Phoenix apps with Flame graphs and live dashboard. And so if you're in the wrong room, now you can awkwardly stand up and, and head out. But uh, my name is Mike Benz. A little bit about me. I've been uh, in Elixir for about eight years. And uh, this, this Sunday is my four-year anniversary at Dockyard. Uh, here you go. Thank you. So um, my socials, uh, First Avenger, across the board, it's, it's, it's a thing. But you know, uh, yeah. Uh, as, as Amos mentioned, I've got a couple libraries. Uh, Cobol to Elixir. So if you if you're, uh, need uh, Cobol, it's, it's cryptically named. Uh, so what it does is it converts Cobol to Elixir, uh, in case that was, it was unclear. Uh, and then uh, Etz uh, is a, an Elixir wrapper around Erlang term storage. Uh, and uh, I've been working on Beacon, as Brian mentioned uh, uh, yesterday, which is a live view CMS. And then, of course, uh, Flame On, which uh, we're here to talk about today. A uh, quick thank you to Dockyard. Um, you may have heard of us. Uh, you know, uh, I, I'm so. so uh, yesterday, the, the, the announcement yesterday has been, was, was just awesome. I'm so, was awesome, and uh, it's so. There's a bunch of great reasons to work for Dockyard. One of the downsides of working for Dockyard is having to sit on information like that, you know, because we've we've seen Live View Native been go, been uh, worked on for the past past uh, however many months, and not being able to see it when people say, you know, hey, I'm thinking about mobile, and I'm thinking, about, you know, hold on, wait, you know. So anyway, uh, Dockyard is a digital product consultancy building custom web applications designed to scale. Uh, if you've seen any of my uh, previous ElixirConf talks, uh, I gave a talk on cars.com where we worked with them to scale their app. And then last year, uh, veeps.com, uh, uh, veeps is a live, live streaming platform uh, that actually uh, kind of, that talk kind of ties into this, this talk. And so if you didn't hear that talk, basically uh, in, in 2021, veeps came to Dockyard and asked us to help them uh, scale. They, uh, they were a ticketing agency for concerts, and then they had this small feature where they would, they would also allow you to live stream concerts if you want. And then COVID happened. And so all these concert venues shut down. And so artists needed a way to still make money because they can't have these concerts. So the live stream streaming portion of Veeps basically blew up and became a huge thing. And they wanted to, to expand that. However, their, their existing Rails app couldn't handle the traffic. There was just too much, too much going on. Uh, and so they came to Dockyard to help rebuild that, uh, and we rebuilt that in Elixir. And the, re the real, because performance was the, the, the concern, what they would deal with is this, what's called, a, we call the thundering herd, or the wall of traffic issue. And what it is is a famous artist tweets out that tickets are on sale for their concert, and all of a sudden, 100,000 people within a minute click on a link and want to buy tickets. And so that, that thundering herd or that, if you're looking at the traffic, it doesn't go up. It's literally a wall, it's just, just vertical wall of traffic. So performance is critical. That was what we needed to uh, make sure that our, because if our new, new app didn't fix that problem, then we just wasted all that time. And so uh, we, uh, I gave a talk, like I said, I gave a talk at LixConf last year, and that was right when we were, we had just wrapped up the development phase, and we said, okay, now we want to go and look and, and see how this, how is this performing? Where do, where might it fall down? Where might we need to, uh, in the future, you know, as, as, when we start seeing traffic, how can we give visibility into that system? And so we ended this, uh, this benchmarking and profiling phase uh, after the, after, uh, in uh, October of last year. And so the first thing we did is we looked around and said, okay, what, what options are out there? How can, we, how can we profile 
How can we uh, get visibility into what, what issues might already exist, that we, something that we need to fix, and how can we make it so that in the future when, when we get traffic and when changes are made, we can see what, what, where things might be slowing down, what, what might be causing issues. And so obviously one of the, the first things you look at is telemetry. Uh, telemetry is built into, it's built into Erlang, so it's, it's, it's uh, kind of a universal thing. Uh, it's, it, tra it just simply tracks metrics, right? So you can say, um, you know, I want to I wanna know how long my Phoenix requests are taking, or I want to know how long my, um, my, my database transactions are taking. You can get a, a good view of those, those individual things, of, of how, uh, how, how your app is, is performing. Uh, it's built into many of the, of the core libraries, so Phoenix Echo, it's all there. It's ready, ready to use. Uh, it does require an external system to collect and display the results or a third, something outside of telemetry itself to, to make those, that data actually useful and visible to you. And there's plenty of, plenty of things out there that can do that. It also requires manual configuration. So you need to say, you know, for this, I want to track my Phoenix apps, uh, Phoenix requests. I want to track Ecto. Uh, but also, if you, if you have your own code and you want to track that, you need to go in and, and make changes to your code to, to, to track each section that you want to actually have a good view into, which, it, which uh, may make sense in your, in your case to do. Uh, and then looking at some other options, so uh, Benchy, if you're not familiar with Benchy, what that does is it's a command line library. Uh, and the idea is that you take, give it a function or give it a couple functions and it'll sit there and just run it repeatedly as many times as it can in profile and say, how long, is this, how long does this function take on average? How much memory is it taking? That sort of stuff. Um, it's, it's useful given a, given a function that you know, you can say, okay, I want to try to take this one thing and see how fast it is. Um, but you need to know what function to say. You, know, you, you need to be able to say, hey, I, th I, I, I want to check this specific section of the code, so I'm going to run it for that. And these, so with both of these tools, they're great for testing speed issues uh, when you already know what, where your problem is, right? Or you might think, you know, I, I, I'm pretty sure my database is having issues. How's, how's the database holding up? Um, but let's say you're, you're tracking your Phoenix requests and they're taking longer than you think they should. Your, but your database requests are fine, those times are fine. So now you're, you're left with, well, something else is going on in the cycle of this request, and I have to go into the code and kind of like, well, maybe it's this, let, let me see this, maybe it's this, maybe, you know. So you kind of have to do some explorations to dig into the code to figure out where it might be. And it might be something completely not obvious, not related to anything that you would think would be causing your system to slow down, and you just have to keep looking until you, and refining to find it. So along come flame graphs. And uh, a flame graph, uh, I don't know how well that's visible, but good, okay. So a flame graph, uh, I like to think of it as a time series graph of a stack trace. So if you have a stack, a stack trace is a point in time. At a, a single point in time in your code, your code is currently executing at a, at a point in, a, in what you, we know as a stack trace. But if we were to take that stack trace and build it out over time, you get a flame graph. And so that, that as you go move into, into functions and out of functions, you're going to have this, this uh, flame-looking thing. And just to kind of uh, explain, a flame graph is really just a bunch of blocks. And each block is a function call. And when there's a block on top of another block, that block is one that was called into. So this example here, we've got this function foo, calls into bar, and then into baz, will show up in this you know, high quality ASCII um, art here. You've got foo, and then it's gonna, uh, you'll see that it's gonna be in bar, and then it'll drop back to foo, and then back, drop into baz. And that's really, really uh, all a flame graph is. Uh, now, if you think with fire, the bigger the flame, the bigger the problem, right? The, the taller the flame. Uh, flame graphs, that's actually not the case. So in the vert in the, on the vertical axis, you're all, what that means is if you're all the way up on a, on a flame graph, it simply means that you're deeper in a stack trace, which may be a problem, may be a code organization issue, whatever, uh, but it is not necessarily a problem. What you really care about is that horizontal axis, the width of the block. And this is where you're going to look for slowdowns, bottlenecks. You're going to look for something that doesn't make sense, right? You're going to read through that and say, you know, uh, for, this, for this example, um, you kind of see, I don't know, 
jump, uh, jump back to the better one, you see there's kind of a section on the left there that's kind of big. And so you kind of go down to the bottom where, where that's described and say, you know, is that should that really be taking uh, a quarter to a third of the time? And then the, the, the other part. So you kind of dig through like that. And so you're looking for uh, proportion. So obviously the, the, the grain flame graph, depending if, you if your flame graph is profiling something that takes, you know, 50 milliseconds versus, you know, six seconds, you're still going to be the same width, right? So what you really care about is the proportion of the time within there. So uh, within the blocks. You're also going to look for, like I said, uh, things like repeating blocks. So if you see something that's just repeated and you see the same pattern over and over and over, that might be okay. That might be what you're designed, you, how your design is set up, but it might not. It's something to, to look at. And so a history of flame graphs, they were created by uh, a guy named Brandon Gregg uh, only about nine years ago, 2013. And he originally created it to track hot CPU cycles in issue, a hot CPU issue in MySQL. And actually, if you go back, this, this graph here is the one you'll see on most of the blogs out there and the stuff talking about flame graphs. That's actually uh, profiling a MySQL request in, uh, in code. So. And that's, that's where the name flame graph comes from, obviously. It, it looks like a flame, especially when you color it orange, and, uh, and then the, the hot issue there. So same year, uh, there was a, an Erlang library released, uh, 2013, which would, allowed you to generate a flame graph in Erlang. It was, the way it was designed, you had to actually add, modify your code around whichever section of code you wanted to, to graph, and then and then you know, redeploy and then run, hit that, that path. We generate an out file, you take that out file and it converted it to an SVG. So it was, it was, it was awesome because it got you uh, a graph, a flame graph, but it had that issue of requiring a new deployment of code, changing your code, uh, and then that manual step to grab that out file. So then along comes uh, eFlambe. And so I'll take a quick aside here. Uh, for the, especially for those of you, uh, if you're listening online or at home, um, you, should, you should come to ElixirConf because it, it, being in person is awesome. Uh, so we'll get, I'll get more into this a little bit later, but uh, e -Flam, Flamon is, is ba based on eFlambe. And last night I was out at, at dinner and randomly sat, so a guy sat down next to me, said, hey, you're Mike, right? I'm Trevor Brown. You, uh, I think you're, <laughs> you're, you're uh, you know, we've been talking about uh, Yves Lambe. So if you're, if you're thinking about coming to ElixirConf, you should be in person. It's, there's, the talks are great, but the talks you can watch online later, but the, the connections at, at ElixirConf are just, just awesome. Anyway, sorry, that's a quick, quick aside. So uh, eFlambe was released late, uh, in late 2021. It was a 48-hour um, the SpawnFest hackathon. Uh, Trevor uh, made this, and it was a re kind of a reimagining of eFlame that kind of took fixed some of the issues were there. And it, what it used did was it used mock to on the fly uh, inject a wrapper around the function that you want, and then trace it, and then drop it back out when it was done. So you didn't have to deploy a new section, a new Start, uh, uh, deployment with that code. So it was a great, great improvement. Um, it also generated uh, these Brandon Gregg file format, BGGG -G -G format, which can be uploaded to a website called SpeedScope to generate a graph. And I'll pause quickly. Uh, so SpeedScope renders top down. So, uh, so far I've been talking about a flame graph rendering from the bottom up. SpeedScope renders from the top down. So the, the top block you'll see is the full length and then you'll see the children uh, below them. Uh, I prefer that. that. To me, that's easier to read and it's more helpful. Uh, so uh, you'll see flame on and everything from here on, you'll see a top-down version of a, a flame graph as opposed to bottom on. So uh, as I mentioned, we, uh, so eFlambe was what we, we used at the time for, for Veeps. And so we, we ran it. This is, this is an, an output from uh, SpeedScope, again, from using eFlambe to, to trace the, the web requests. And what you'll see here, this was the first issue that we came across that we found and we were able to fix, is again, how I mentioned uh, the repeating, repeating code blocks. And you'll see on the left that there is about 20 blocks of re repetition on, uh, uh, there. And then on the right, there's about 10 to 15 blocks of repetition. And so 
we were like, okay, that's, that's interesting. And when we dug into what the block was, the block is what we would call a, card, a rendering of a card block. So it was actually it was a, it was a live view render call for a card block. And on Veeps, their website, they have these what are called cards. And each one is an event. It's an event card. And each one has an image and the title of the event and the, uh, the date right for when, it, when it's, when it's going to show up, when the event is. And so we're like, okay, so we see 20 in one chunk, and then we see like 10 to 15 in another chunk. So wh what's going on here? And what we realized was um, that when we go to pull up the home page, there was about 20 cards on it, right? There's, it, it, it was exactly 19, 20, whatever. There was that number of cards were on the home page. And we're like, okay, so that makes sense. Those 20 on the left, we were expecting that. That's, that's normal, that's okay. But what's going on with these other ones? Why, why, how are we, there's another, you know, a third of the request is these other ones. And what we, after digging in a bit, what we realized was that uh, on their site, there's a global header, and that global header has a search bar. And when you click the search bar, the, the modal expands, and inside that modal, there were suggested events inside the search functionality, right? And so the, the problem was, that that pop-up was written in Alpine by someone who doesn't, didn't, that was newer to LiveView and didn't really understand the difference between implementing that pop-up in, in, in Alpine versus implementing it in LiveView. And so we simply took that, swapped it over to be a LiveView render, and now though we weren't paying the cost for that render in the background on every single page on the app. Obviously, you know, when you click search, it, there was, there was a delay because it did have to actually render there, but it was, a, it was not even noticeable. But we were also saving all that time on every other page in the app. And so, so that was the first issue we ran into. But then we dug into those, those card renders, the, the event card renders themselves. We said, okay, well, you know, how, those, those are the majority of this time. So what, what's actually going on in that render? And what we, what we saw was this, this, uh, this, is, this is clicking into just, the, just one card, uh, card event render. And right in the center there, uh, you'll see the, the, the second line down, there's a blue block. And what that is, is that's the uh, localized date time function that we were calling. So if we go, go back over here, we, you see that we've got the date right there. But we want the, one of the requirements was that date would show up in, obviously, the user's uh, time zone. So uh, because it was worldwide, someone would be jumping in from Hawaii versus, uh, versus Australia, and it, it, it could be a different day. So we didn't want to give the wrong, wrong information. So that, we, we weren't sure if that, was, that made sense. Like, you know, sh it should, it be, should it take that amount of time to render that, uh, that time zone? And if you're not familiar with, with how time zones work in Elixir, Elixir has built in the mechanism to convert time zones, convert a time between time zones, but it doesn't include the database itself of time zones, because if you've ever worked with time zones, it's a nightmare. And so um, I think Elixir smartly said, yeah, we're in, we'll let someone else deal with that. So, you, so if you want to do anything other than the UTC time zone, you have to bring in a third-party app, third-party library. Uh, and TZ data has kind of been like the standard that everyone's been, been using. It's been around for a while. So we were like, well, you know, are there other options out there? So we, we found there was another one called TZ, and we used Benchy, which I mentioned earlier, to compare TZ and TZ data for this one function. We only used one function out of the whole thing. And so we compared that one, one call if using TZ and using TZ data. And it turned out using TZ was uh, almost 13 times faster for that one call than TZ data. So we simply swapped the libraries out. Everything worked exactly the same. Just much faster for that one section. And so then basically we've just eliminated a third of that request time that was being, being uh, used. All right. So, so we did that. We got, we, there was a, number, a couple other things that we found and we, we resolved. And, and uh, then after the engagement with Veeps wrapped up, we said, okay, well, we, we've learned flame graphs. We know what flame graphs are and, and there's this cool tool to, to, use, to do them. Let's write a blog post, right? Because that's what that's what that's what you do. Um, so we got the blog post already ready to go, um, and right before we were going to publish it, the idea came up. Well, what if we did this in Live View, right? Imagine having a Live View dashboard that you can do this without having to mess around with like 
IEX and files and speed scope and all that. So, so what we did was we, we did that. And the initial version, that's where the initial version of Flame On came in. And it was basically a wrapper around Eflon Bay because Eflon Bay was great. It did exactly what we needed. Um, and so uh, built that uh, and put that out. And we actually used it. So one of the things that, that Dockyard does is we do architectural reviews for companies. And so we had an architectural review actually for Kamana, who's uh, one of the, right there, uh, Kamana, and, um, which is a great company, by the way, if you go check out their, blue, their booth, um, they're hiring Elixir uh, devs too, so uh, go check them out. But we ran this, and we quickly kind of realized that there was issues with, um, so Eflon Bay was, was great for how, what it was designed for, but we, the API into it was, didn't match our needs. And so what would happen is we would call and we would say, hey, all right, Eflon Bay, do your thing, um, profile this function, and then we would have to wait for a file to show up. And that file either would show up or wouldn't if something went wrong. And there was no way to tell if it just hadn't shown up yet or, you know. And so looking at it, um, we decided that it would be best to take what Eflon Bay had done in Erlang and tweak it for our needs and rewrite it in Elixir. And so that was the, the most recent engine uh, that was uh, rewritten for Flameon is, is written itself in Elixir, but using, using the, the techniques that, uh, that Trevor had done in Eflon Bay because they were, they were spot on on how to, how to track that. Uh, so, demo. I'm going to break the rule of, of, uh, of conference talks and actually try a live demo. Um, but the idea here, the, the purpose of this demo is to show you basically how easy it is to add Flame onto your existing, existing app. Uh, should do time share? All right. Um, and so what we have here is a brand new uh, Mix Phoenix new uh, app that's been spun up. The only thing I've done in here is that I have added some code to the, the default page, right? We're going to uh, grab some data out of these three functions. Uh, and this is, you'll see, this is, it's a contrived example that, that, that you know, uh, but hopefully it'll show you how, how you get up to speed with running this. So, so what we'll do is there's a bug in this code. I'm not going to share the code because that would give it away, but we'll, um, we'll run, the, run this code. And take a look at it. And when, we, when I refresh this page, what you'll see is this, this page takes about six seconds to load. And from what we expect, we're, we're pulling a lot of data, so we expect that this page should take about two seconds to load, but it's taking six. So something's not right here in this code. And uh, I'll do that again. If I click refresh, it's going to take about six seconds for that to load. Uh, okay. There you go. All right. So that's a problem, right? We, we need to figure out why it's taking so long. So let's, let's uh, jump in and uh, right on the, um, on the Flame On site, uh, the two, there's only two things you need to do to add Flame On to your system and get it running. So we'll, uh, we'll stop, uh, stop Phoenix. And in our mix.exs, we will simply add Flame On, latest version. Uh, let's make sure that we, have, or, so that we have this. All right, so that's good. It's in. Um, so that pulled in uh, Flame On. And then the second thing we need to do is to simply add a live dashboard page. And so if you, uh, it's two, two lines of code if you already have live dashboard uh, in your system. Uh, let's see. So we simply add this to the router, jump down to the da live dashboard page, and at the end here, uh, we are going to paste that, that line for, uh, for the additional page. We'll save that, run Phoenix server again, and then jump over, and just to make sure we're still uh, taking about six seconds to load this page, that, the, that things are still slow. Uh, yeah, okay, so it's about six seconds. Now, we can jump over to our live dashboard, and what you'll see is that you now have this Flame On page on the right here. I'll click on that. And the way that, the way that Flame On works, as I mentioned, is you, you tell it what function to profile. And for, for Phoenix uh, dead view renders 
And for the dead render of the Phoenix Live View, uh, Cowboy Handler is the uh, .xq is the best one to, to tag onto. And so that's, that's in there by default. But if, you, if you're doing, you know, this doesn't have to be Phoenix, it can be whatever you want to profile any function. So we're gonna click Flame On, and profile, uh, profiling is running, and I'm gonna refresh this, and it's gonna take, again, six seconds to load. And as soon as it loads, if we jump back over into Live Dashboard, we have a, uh, we have a flame graph. And what we see here is that all this time is happening in rendering, right? Because obviously, just because of how we have the, the page layout uh, going. But when we drop down here to the blocks, uh, you, may, you probably won't, may not be able to see this, but that get foo data is taking about a second to load. Uh, get bar data is taking about a quarter second to load. Uh, but over here, get baz data is taking five seconds to load, right? And we know this whole thing should only take about two seconds. So clearly, there's going to be some problem with that function. It's taking longer than it should to, to load. So we jump over into our code uh, and uh, look at the page view. What we see here is that uh, this is, uh, again, it's a contrived example, but uh, foo should take one second, right? Uh, bar should take a quarter of a second, and baz should take half a second. But someone typoed that, right? They added an extra zero, and that's where our extra time has gone. So if we save that, we jump back in, and we refresh, obviously, you know, this isn't, rocket science, it's going to load faster. And so we've found something that was wrong in our code based on a, uh, a graph. And we can actually go in and rerun that, uh, rerun that flame graph over here. And we'll see that you've got uh, foo takes a second, uh, bar takes a quarter of a second, and baz is now uh, behaving and taking the half a second that it's, it's supposed to. So that's, that's how simple it is to add Flame on to an existing project. Uh, let's see. And um, yeah, so. And these are, so obviously when you, we, we, if you're dealing with sleeps, you're gonna get these really not fun looking blocky uh, graphs, but, but there's, you know, you, you'll get some really, really interesting graphs like this when you run it on a, on a, 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 real, uh, a real request. And so, uh, as you saw, Flameon is available on Hex. You can add it to your project. Uh, that's the, the repo up uh, on, on the uh, Dockyard GitHub. And yeah, I would love to see your flame graphs of your apps. So uh, post them up there. Uh, tag me on Twitter. I'd love to see, see, see what's going on and, and what sort of issues you find in your, your code. Uh, Dockyard's also giving, I mentioned we do uh, architectural reviews. We're giving away a, three, a free three-hour architectural review. So if your company's using Elixir uh, and would like uh, a free, free uh, review of what's going on, conversation with us, uh, go and, and check that out. We'll be pulling the raffle uh, later today. Stop by our booth. So, and that's, uh, that's it.